Here at the 2009 Canadian Business Leadership Forum, I'm joined by Thomas Homer Dixon, the CG Chair of Global Systems at the uh, Balsa Lee School of International Affairs. He's also a professor in the Centre of Environment uh, in Business, uh, in the Faculty of Environment at the University of Waterloo. Thank you for joining us. Great to be here. Um, it, you talk about a growing awareness among uh, climate scientists uh, that the world doesn't need to just reduce carbon emissions, but it needs to work as quickly as possible to zero carbon emissions. Uh, that sounds like an enormous and frankly insurmountable challenge. I, how do you see this, uh, this uh, uh, being possible? It does sound like an insurmountable challenge and unfortunately the science is telling us that's where we need to go. Uh, every extra kilogram of carbon that we add to the atmosphere more or less commits us to a permanent warming. Uh, and, that's, uh, and that's something we've only really realized in the last few years. Now, we have two alternatives. We can either accept the science and get on with doing something about it, or we can just hope it goes away and, and try to maintain the status quo. I think the, the, the second approach is really not a viable one. It's certainly not a good idea for our children who might have to deal with climate change. Uh, I think when we start to actually look at the technical challenge of moving to zero carbon emissions, it turns out to be more tractable, more manageable than a lot of people would realize. Now, it's going to be easiest to get the first 10 percent, 50 percent, and it's going to be hard, really hard to get the last 10 percent. Uh, but uh, we've got to remember that once we start in particular to price carbon emissions, we start to start to put a price on, on using the atmosphere as a garbage dump for our carbon dioxide, uh, then that's going to stimulate an enormous amount of entrepreneurship and inventiveness in our economies. And we're going to find new ways of doing things that don't involve carbon-based fuels. Uh, so I, I'm, I, I'm pretty optimistic because human beings are really the most creative creatures uh, imaginable almost. I mean, we are, just have an extraordinary ability to invent solutions to problems. And we also have available to us markets, capitalist markets, that are the most extraordinary engines of innovation that humankind has ever produced. I think if you couple these things together, we have every opportunity. It will take us quite likely a century or more to zero out carbon, but, uh, but I think we can do it. I have no doubt that we can do it. Uh, there's obviously a need for more uh, unconventional technologies, more entrepreneurship, um, and, and that's a role the business community can play. Um, you also talk about the need for more, uh, that there will be a requirement for a greater state intervention um, in the economy. How, what kind of state intervention do you, do, do you see coming? Is, this, is that carbon tax? Well, we have to remember that, that uh, states are always involved in the economy because they create the institutional environment in which markets can exist. So this idea that it's sort of states versus markets, governments versus markets, I think is deeply misguided. Uh, governments create markets. They make them possible through property rights, laws, and limited liability legislation, banking systems that are well managed. Uh, uh, court systems that enforce contracts. All of these things have to be in place. So what we're doing right now is we're adding, we're adding an additional component to an already extremely complex uh, institutional environment that will allow us to deal with this climate change and energy problem that we face. Yes, it's going to involve some government intervention, but what the government is doing essentially by placing a price on carbon, is it's creating a space in which entrepreneurs can work and be rewarded for the cre creativity and entrepreneurship. Right at the moment, that space doesn't exist. All these people out there who want to get going, get cracking on solving the climate problem, uh, uh, aren't going to be rewarded effectively for it. What the government can do is make sure the rewards are there, and, and, and then the market gets to work. It's the same as any other market that we've created in the past, uh, and the government is always involved if it's going to work effectively. How much of a setback has the global financial crisis been to keeping uh, climate change on the, on the political agenda? I think it's been a significant setback in the short term, but I don't think it's going to matter very much in the longer term because the evidence that, that, uh, about climate change and our energy problems will continue to accumulate over time. And I mean, it, there'll be ups and downs. There'll be some times when people think the problem's going away, but then it will pop back in a, in a really powerful way in one, with, with you know, some kind of drought or storm or major event or there'll be an energy shock. And so I, I expect over time that the, the vagaries and, and swings back and forth in our global economy 
will not actually affect our long-term commitment and, and, and our long-term need to do something about climate and energy because this is a, this is a multi-decadal long problem that we face, whereas these economic swings, they have consequences over periods of years, but they tend to get washed out over time. Thank you very much for joining us. Great, thank you.